ambassador of the um, European Commission in the United States of America. President Obama has differed quite radically from President Bush on the climate change issue in the sense that he made dealing with it and he made having a cap and trade system to put a cap on emissions and to reward those who limit their emissions uh, center of his, his campaign. And it would be fair to say that President Obama has received a mandate from the American people through the majority he obtained uh, in the election to act on this issue. Uh, the challenge now is to ensure that the Houses of Congress, both of which are also uh, democratic in their majority, would act on this issue and produce legislation on climate change uh, that has uh, sure, uh, uh, that is clear is going to pass before uh, the meeting in Copenhagen in December when the rest of the world has to gather and make its commitments along with the United States. I think there is a constituency in the United States that distrusts government regulation of anything because they have doubts about the federal government and some of this goes back you know, into the middle of the 19th century in terms of its origins or even earlier. Uh, and those people don't want to see the government regulating health care, they don't want to see it regulating climate, they don't want to see it, um, they don't, some of them would prefer if it didn't even impose any taxation. Uh, so that's one constituency. Another constituency clearly are those who might lose um, or might have to make sacrifices to reduce uh, America's greenhouse gas emissions the oil industry might be amongst those and some parts of the coal industry. But increasingly both of those industries are saying, look, we're going to have to deal with this. We understand that the United States is vulnerable politically and in security terms if it is this dependent on imported energy. And therefore for security purposes the United States in any event needs to limit its emissions. But also there is a real problem of climate change that has to be dealt with, that is being caused in part at least by uh, human action. I've been a politician for 35 years, I've been a member of a legislature for 35 years, and I do find it a bit hard to accept an argument that you can't deal with two problems at the same time in a legislature. Um, the, the, the House and the Senate are passing legislation on issues almost every week. Uh, they are very well staffed up. They have plenty of resources for studying issues. So I don't really think that it's adequate to say, well, because we're dealing with health care, we can't deal with climate change as well. Uh, I think a legislature that clearly has in both cases a majority of the same party as the president um, ought to be in a position to deal with both items on the President's agenda, particularly on climate change, because there is a deadline, and that deadline is December in Copenhagen, by which the United States has to show that it's willing and able to act on this subject. I think the United States needs to lead by example in Copenhagen. I think if you are a country, as the United States is, which is responsible for a disproportionate amount of the greenhouse gases that are already in the atmosphere, as is Europe as well. And if you're currently emitting 20 tonnes of greenhouse gases per person per year into the atmosphere, and if your emissions constitute a quarter of all the world's emissions, then clearly you can't just say you're going to lead by prescription. You've got to lead by example as well as prescription. And the background to this, of course, is that the United States wasn't able to join the global consensus in the Kyoto Protocol. So there's a big fear that we could have Kyoto all over again, that everybody else would come wanting to make commitments and the United States might agree to something at the conference, but then when it goes back and wants to get that treaty ratified, 
in the Senate and the House that it won't be able to deliver. So that's why it's important that the Senate and the House should do their business before the US delegation goes to Copenhagen, because otherwise the US delegation may be giving commitments that the world will not be satisfied, the Senate and the House will subsequently be able to validate. There is something on the table now, and that is in the actions that are being taken by the Environmental Protection Agency that were advised, uh, that were, were um, announced this week. Uh, and that uh, is, is, is a step forward. I don't think it's enough to get China and India and all the other countries on board, but it's at least a sign of willingness on the part of the administration. But for the result of an international conference to be binding in the United States, it's not enough for the administration to sign up to it. The Senate and the House must be willing to do so. And those others who are committing themselves in Copenhagen want to know that if they commit themselves to something in response to something that the United States is committing itself to, that what the United States is committing itself to is real and will really be adopted by the House and the Senate. And that's why the House and the Senate need to act on this before Copenhagen, not after. One very big difference is that American politicians are, if you like, sole traders. Each one of them makes his own calculations as to what he's going to do in the interest of his re-election in his own particular district or state. In Europe, there's much more party discipline and members very often are placed on a list and are elected from a national list that's selected by the party. So they're much more looking to the party for approval than to their immediate local electorate for approval. And in general terms, party discipline is much stronger in the parliamentary system in Britain, in Ireland, and indeed in all of the European countries. Whereas here in the United States, uh, party discipline is important, but it's not that important and members will, it's difficult to get members to do something that their constituents don't like. But if you have a situation where people will not ever do anything that their constituents don't like, you probably will not be able to lead or take initiatives on things that need to be dealt with. I think that politicians are extremely varied. I mean, I, I know I obviously have very good knowledge of Irish politicians, having worked with them. I know a lot of party leaders from European countries and many members of the European Parliament, and now I know almost most of the members of the House and the Senate. And the thing that really strikes me is that they're all very different. Uh, their personalities are different. They are literally representative of the population in their variety. Uh, so you can't generalise. Some are very academic, some are very stern, some are very cheerful, some are very populist, some are very uh, relaxed, and some are not so relaxed. But that's the case in, in every political system. Um, I, I think that the overwhelming majority of politicians are not in politics for the money. Uh, they could, most of them, in most countries, do better at some other career. They're in politics because they believe it gives them an opportunity to serve the public and to serve their ideals. Obviously, they have to make compromises along the way because compromise is the essence of politics. Uh, and sometimes those compromises maybe are more than they ought to have made. But politicians are there to serve the public interest in the majority of cases. And while there will be examples of people that ought to not to be in politics because of things they've done, the overwhelming majority are not in that category. And I think uh, it's important that we don't encourage an anti-politician attitude, because if you have an anti-politician attitude in a country or in the media, then in essence you have an anti-representative democracy attitude. And representative democracy is the way we run our affairs. You can't have every issue that's important put to uh, the electorate individually to vote in a referendum. You'd be having a referendum every two or three days if that was the case, and people would get thoroughly sick of it, and nothing would happen. So we have instead representatives whom we delegate to deal with things for us on the basis that we can sack them at the next election. Well, it's important that people understand that that's 
the essence of democracy, and that the people who are their representatives deserve you know, a, you know, a modicum of support and respect in their work, and that they should respect one another in their work, while, of course, disagreeing when that's the right thing to do. Well, I suppose one of the most uh, interesting conversations I had, I had very recently, um, and it was not so much the conversation as the situation in which it took place that surprised me. I visited Mayor Bloomberg, if you would call him a local politician, he's the mayor of a, of a city on an island, um, and there he was in a booth with, on, on the phone, surrounded by other people in booths on the phone. He has no office and he does all his business surrounded by the people who may execute his decisions on his behalf. And they all have you know, eye contact with him, or potentially have eye contact with him all the time that he's in the office. Um, I don't imagine, I, could, I, could, I couldn't imagine any prime minister of a country running his country like that. And yet, I was highly impressed by the way Mayor Bloomberg does things, because he is personally accountable and personally accessible to those who must implement his decisions. And that shortens all the bureaucratic paper trails uh, that exist in governmental systems elsewhere, where people are exchanging memoranda and not replying to memoranda and decisions are taking weeks and months to be taken, whereas in the way that New York is run, there's the possibility of decisions being taken literally the instant the problem arises. And that, that, that impressed me uh, a lot. I think there was uh, a lot of materialism uh, in the last 10 years where people because they had it, they had to spend it. And because they were spending it, they had to make sure that other people knew that they were spending it and knew that they had it. Uh, and that, you know, I think somewhat may have coarsened uh, cultural life and social life a little bit in Ireland. Um, and I think also people probably didn't realise fully the sources of their wealth. They thought that it was all their own work, that it was just that they were so good at whatever it was they were doing, that the salary that they were getting and the opportunities they were getting were all generated by themselves, which of course wasn't the case. The reality of the Celtic Tiger is that the foundations for the economic growth that took off in 1994 um, were laid in the case of the low tax policy in 1956 by the late Gerard Sweet, the Minister for Finance. In the case of free education, which pr produced the young people who had, were attractive to foreign investors, a decision taken by the late Donahoe Malley in 1966. Then in the 1970s, the establishment of the regional technological colleges by Porrick Faulkner, another man who's none of these three people are much talked of today. And yet their decisions were the decisions that it created the Celtic Tiger that happened to just really burst out when I was fortunate enough to be the Prime Minister. But I would be the first to say that the foundations of that success were not laid uh, principally by myself, but by people who, many of whom had left politics before I even entered it. I do think it was possible. I think you can divide the Celtic Tiger period up into two. There was the period from, you know, 1990 for 2000, when the very rapid growth, up to 11% per annum in 1997, took place. And that was entirely founded on productivity increases that were taking place at that time, and e export markets that Ireland was winning, and competitiveness gains that Ireland had made. Around 2000, those factors started easing off, and really the growth should have eased off at that stage, and we wouldn't have so many problems today. But from 2000 on, there was this rush of credit into the Irish economy from the international banking system, thanks to securitization and other things. There, was, there were Irish banks pressing money on people, pressing money on individuals to borrow money to buy a house in the Algarve or something like that, pressing money on building developers to you know, 
we'll offer you 100% of the cost to buy a hotel in New York or to build houses in Bulgaria or whatever. And there was this wall of money that was just being pushed at people. And it was the use of that that generated artificially rapid and unsustainably rapid economic growth from 2000 up to 2007, which wasn't founded on real improvements in productivity, but was founded on speculative activity, uh, which was based on the assumption that prices only go up, they never go down. Now we know house prices don't always go up, they can go down, and there are a number of individuals with unsustainable financial positions and a number of Irish banks with unsustainable financial positions from which they have had to be rescued by the Irish taxpayer. Um, but I think you, 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 know, you need to make the distinction between the earlier first seven years, if you like, and the second seven years. In the sense that securitization, which was a very ingenious way of spreading risk, was initiated in the United States and spread from the United States elsewhere without people realizing that although it minimized risks in the short run, it made what would otherwise have been localized risks, risks to the entire system as it spread more widely, in the sense that nobody recognized that. The US, and they recognized that risk, the US has a bigger responsibility because it was in the US that this method uh, originated. On the other hand, it has to be said that it wasn't just American banks that bought these subprime mortgages, that bought these securitized products. European banks, with their eyes open, bought these things. And their supervisors, the central banks of Europe, knew that they were doing it. So if there was a supervisory, supervisory failure, and clearly there was, that's not just an American failure. It's a failure of all of those countries and regulators that were regulating banks that were engaging in this risky activity. I think we need to have uh, comparable standards or mutually recognizable standards for supervising banks because I think it's reasonable that banks should be able to operate in other countries. Um, otherwise you're going to have national monopoly banks and that's going to be good only for the bankers and the consumer is going to lose. The margins between the lending rate and the, and the borrowing rate will get very high and the benefit in the middle will be taken by bank shareholders. That's not good. And to control that you need competition. And you need competition from other countries. But the problem is that if banks get into trouble, the people who are asked to help them out and save them are the taxpayers of the one country in which they're located. Not all of the countries in which they're operating, but the one country in which they're operating. Uh, Ireland has had to rescue, for example, its banks, and a lot of their business was overseas. So if you have you know, global banking, but national financial responsibility on national taxpayers, you've got to find some way of, of mediating between the two of them. And one way of doing that would be to have mutually recognized supervisory standards where a, 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 an American uh, regulator would know that if a French bank was operating here in the United States, that the standards of regulation and the standards of, of making sure that that bank wasn't making foolish decisions were equivalent to the ones that the American regulator would be applying to an American bank competing with it on the American high street. Uh, so getting more mutual recognition and more standardization of uh, bank supervision st supervisory standards and perhaps placing particular limits on particular types of activity like securitization uh, makes sense. I think the G20 is a big improvement. Uh, and indeed, the creation of the G20 is one of the few good things that have come out of this appalling economic uh, crisis that we have. Uh, we have had for a long time a lot of organizations dealing with the global economy. We have the uh, 
World Trade Organization, the International Labour Organization, the World Bank, the IMF, we have a Financial Stability Forum, and I could go on and on and on. But they're all sort of separate silos, operating in separate silos. And up to now, there's been no overarching um, board of directors, if you like, that's politically accountable to tell them, this is your agenda and this is the direction in which you should go and we'll be checking up on you so off, every so often and we'll, if we, you haven't acted on what we said, we'll be asking some questions the next time we meet. We now have that in the G20 where we have the politically accountable leaders of countries representing, I think, over 90% of the entire income generated in the entire world every year. And that's much better than anything we had before. There is someone now in charge of the world economy. Uh, which there wasn't before. There was a lot of independent actions, but there wasn't coordination. So I think that's a huge step forward. The G8 was a much more limited thing uh, because it didn't have representation of some of the major emerging economies who are represented in the G20. Obviously, the G20 may have to change. Uh, one of the things we've learned recently is you know, we, we set up organisations with a rigid format, but things change. There are countries who could now claim that they should be on the UN Security Council because they're bigger and more important than some of the countries that are currently on the UN Security Council. But we can't change it because it's all laid down in a, in a UN, uh, in UN uh, treaties. With the G20, hopefully we have a more flexible instrument and we'll be able to make the changes as we go along to ensure that it continues to be uh, comprehensive and representative of the entire world. An increase in unemployment will always be faster in the United States than it will be in Europe because people have less job security here. But equally, a pickup in employment will be faster in the United States than it will be in Europe because firms are more willing to recruit people because they know they can, if necessary, dispense with their services if they need to. One of the, one of the uh, effects of the very much heavier job protection systems in Europe is that it slows down a decline, but it makes the recovery also much, much slower. I have to say, I think a balance uh, needs to be struck here. I think if you have employers who feel that they can just dispense with people uh, very easily and that there's no consequence and that they don't have to think very much, they recruit somebody and then they get rid of them, uh, that's not human. That's not, that's not intelligent, really. It's not taking into account the fact that anybody you employ, he's a human asset, but it's also he's a human being. And you, to get the best performance from him or her in, this, in his or her job, he has to feel that he has a measure of security because we all need, we need freedom, but we also need security. We're, in each one of us, that need is there. Uh, so a legal system that recognises both I think is better than one which says, well, it's all freedom, you're free to go and we're, I'm free to sack you. Uh, that wouldn't work. But equally, a system which said, you know, well, once you get a job with our company, you will never lose it. Well, people are not going to work hard if that's the case. Uh, there's not going to be adaptability if that's the case. So some sort of midpoint in this, uh, where there are some penalties involved for employers in getting rid of employees, that it's not just a matter of clicking their finger, uh, I think is preferable to no uh, controls, but too much controls can lead to stagnation. In general, but there are wide varieties in Europe between you know, countries like you know, Britain and Ireland, which are closer to the United States. They don't have the same you know, rigidities built into their labour market to prevent people losing their jobs. And other countries like France, where, uh, where it's very difficult, or if you're in protected employment, in, in other countries as well, it's very difficult for you to lose your job. There, there's, a, there's a sort of a spectrum uh, within, within Europe as far as this is concerned. I, I think the one uh, the thing that, that worries anybody who's a parent uh, is what their children will be doing uh, 10 years from now. Will there be employment for them? Will there be employment that they'll be satisfied with, that their talents will be used in? And uh, I, while I, you know, it's very hard to keep me up at night, I sleep very soundly, 
um, I suppose that has to be the number one worry. We all have you know, our own families and we tend to worry about them proportionately more than anybody else. Um, as far as uh, the, the wider issues are concerned, I suppose uh, I should worry more about nuclear proliferation than I do because it does represent a genuinely existential threat if you've got nuclear weapons into the hands, not of s more states, but of non-state actors or terrorists. That represents you know, the possibility of wiping you know, millions of people out uh, almost overnight. And that's the thing I feel I should worry about more <laughs> than I do. But it's so, it's so overwhelming a threat that it's hard to even get your head around it. Therefore, it's hard to worry about it as much as you should. Um, I, I also worry a little bit, and I say this as a, as a European, I, I, and as somebody who's deeply committed to the European Union, which I regard as the, you know, the great piece of inventive statesmanship of the 20th century, which you know, voluntarily bringing together 27 countries, which were previously, many of them, dictatorships and many of them at war with one another in recent living memory, they're all now working harmoniously or relatively harmoniously together in the European Union. My worry has to be that the next generation of people will simply take all that for granted and will revert to sort of playing a game of national advantage in Europe and forgetting that, you know, we've got to preserve the superstructure as well. We've got to preserve the union as well as pursuing our own individual states' interests. And uh, keeping a multifarious union like the European Union together isn't easy. I mean, you've had the experience in this country that a very successful union, the first federation in the world, the first democracy in modern times, the United States of America, it still tore itself apart between 1861 and 1865 on, 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 on very, very important issues. Well. That might have been avoided if people were willing to you know, put the preservation of the Union first and to make compromises earlier than they were prepared to make them. Uh, in the case of the European Union, I see you know, sort of nationalistic tendencies coming up and countries trying to you know, give aid to their industry that would give their industry an advantage over the industry of another European country. I see voters trying to blame the European Union for things that they know really in their hearts are either their own fault or the fault of their own government. But the European Union is a sort of a convenient um, whipping boy for whatever it is they're frustrated about. And I see politicians blaming the European Union for things that they've decided themselves as well. And that sort of behaviour is corrosive in, in the end. And in the end, you know, this union, which is, as I say, a tremendous creative uh, experiment, um, is fragile and you know it can't necess won't necessarily be there 50 years from now if we don't take care of it. Mr. Gorbachev. I've met him, I shook hands with him, but I've never sat down and talked to him because if you think about it, he probably did more to change the world than anybody. Uh, yes, there were these tremendous tensions within the Soviet system. Uh, but instead of using force to repress those tensions, he adopted a policy of openness of perestroika and glasnost. And glasnost is openness and perestroika was reform. And he, he, he sort of a let air in. Now he didn't know what was going to happen. In fact, what happened wasn't what he wanted. He wanted to preserve the communist system. But he had enough confidence in the Russian people that he let them determine the future and he let the nations that had previously been under Soviet domination determine their own future without militarily interfering. And in a sense, he put his own convictions section, second to the confidence that he had in the people who previously had been repressed by his predecessors. So while I think Ronald Reagan deserves credit, a lot of people deserve credit, and of course Vaclav Havel and Lech Valenza and all these people in Poland, Czech Republic and so forth, they deserve credit too. But they really wouldn't have been able to do what they did, uh, to basically reunite li Europe and liberate 
people who'd been under communism if Gorbachev wasn't the man that Gorbachev is. And um, I think I'd like to meet him. Uh, I don't know what, how the conversation would go. Um, I might be just telling him that I think he's a great guy. And he might be telling me, oh, my God, I didn't intend this. I wish it hadn't happened the way it had. And, you know, I don't know what would happen after that. Um, but, uh, you know, he, he, he's a man I'd like, I'd like to meet and like to shake his hand. I was never really an ideological conservative in the sense that I believe that the free market is always right. Uh, I was more somebody who put caution before, uh, beside innovation, whenever innovation had to be considered, and I would try my best to see what were the, you know, the downsides of something as well as the upsides. And I think there is always, in any political system, a need for a strong conservative voice in that sense that looks at the effect on the overall organism of the change that's proposed rather than at whether the particular change is merit in and of itself. And that sort of conservatism is something that will never die and will always be necessary. Uh, and it's quite different from you know, radical free market thinking, which in fact, in some respects, can be anti-conservative because it can cut away some of the, or undermine some of the sort of social habits that people have of solidarity for others, of charity, of you know, providing perfection and security for people because those don't cohere exactly with the free market. Uh, so the free, free marketism, free, free marketeering can in fact be anti-conservative rather than conservative in depending on the, on the circumstances. And in any way, it's only a means to an end. The free market is a means of delivering welfare to people and prosperity. It's not an end in itself. Whereas conserving what's good while adapting is uh, something that is uh, good in itself. Um, I would describe myself, uh, first and foremost, as a Christian Democrat uh, rather than as a conservative, uh, because I think, uh, and I'm a practicing Catholic, but I think you don't have to be practicing any religion to recognize that Christianity um, moderated some of the most extreme uh, aggressions that were seen in pre-Christian Europe uh, by you know, creating a sense of responsibility to one's fellow man, of loving one's neighbor, of of a sense that you know there was a next life and that what you did wrong here could not be to your advantage in the next life and therefore that quite apart from whether the police might catch you, your own uh, interests would suggest to you that you should behave yourself in a reasonable way relative to other people. Those were the straining issues that were uh, promoting also social justice that emanate from Christianity and that's why I think uh, I'm happy to be, describe myself as a, as a Christian Democrat. Um, and that's a strong European uh, tradition as well. Chancellor Merkel of Germany is, is a Christian Democrat uh, too. Um, uh, but uh, oh, there are elements of conservatism in Christian democracy, but also there are elements of, 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 of you know, requiring to make changes. I think the fact that our Irish people have uh, voted twice now to reject EU treaties, they rejected the Nice Treaty first, and then they changed their mind and accepted it the second time, and now they are, it looks as if, having rejected the Lisbon Treaty, they will vote to accept it. That this has created a measure of uncertainty, which uh, will remain, and will make it more difficult for the European Union to contemplate future treaty revisions because it will say to itself, well, we have to get this through an Irish referendum as well as getting the Irish government to agree to it. It's not enough to get the government that the people have elected to agree. We've got to have a referendum as well. And that added uncertainty uh, is going, I think, to make it make European Union leaders hesitant to amend their treaties. Now, in my view, any organization has to have the capacity to amend its rules and has to have not a capacity to do it easily, but to do it when necessary, responsibly. And my worry is that we have, because of the 
way in which uh, referenda have gone in Ireland and the insistence on referenda on matters of detail that normally wouldn't be the subject of referenda because of Supreme Court decisions. We've created a sort of an artificial blockage in the renewal of the European Union, which isn't a very good thing. And it's a problem that will remain with us. The second uh, consequence, however, I think will be, uh, if the, uh, as there will be a yes vote, as I expect, um, will be that the uh, Ireland will be, for day-to-day -day purposes, um, in a more influential position in influencing what the EU does than it would be if the Irish people had voted no. If the Irish people had voted no, the priority would have been for the rest of Europe to find a way basically of circumventing Ireland, to go around Ireland rather than involve Ireland in whatever they needed to do, uh, and to try and find a way of doing anything that, didn't, that they could do without having to get Ireland involved because you know, Ireland is, has this complication. Uh, so uh, that's not a good position, for, would not have been a good position for Ireland to be in because for Ireland needs to be able to influence EU decisions. We are the most open economy in Europe to the rest of Europe. We are more influenced by what other countries do than any other country in Europe is influenced by other countries. So therefore, we need to be able to influence our surroundings more than others need to influence their surroundings. And the way we have of doing that is by being a full-hearted and fully participating member of the European Union.